Hi again everyone, it's uh, Darius Booker. I am uh, the owner of Integral Forest Management and I am the Canadian rep for RTI, the makers of Teabag Fertilizer. Um, what I'd like to do today out here with this video is just give everybody an idea of the longer term effects on survival uh, that fertilizing at the time of planting with RTI products can have on your seedlings. Most people tend to think and be concerned about survival in year one. But right now in the area that I'm standing in, the interior Douglas fir, these are extremely challenging dry sites. And even if you get through the first growing season and you manage to get a tree through it and it's alive, that does not mean in any way, shape or form that it has the vigor and the strength that it needs to be able to get through the longer term. <clears throat> this year was the ultimate test. It's 2021, it's September 2nd. We're roughly two months after the heat dome passed through. The ridge that I'm standing on right now would have been 40 to 45 degrees Celsius, maybe even more with the radiant heat coming off of the ground. So if there is ever a set of trees that would be tested um, as far as survival is concerned, in the second year after planting, um, and, it, and had been fertilized at the time of planting. These are them. So just a brief overview of this site. This site is actually in the McClure fire. It burned in 2003, um, burned extremely hot. They came in and tried a couple of years after the fire to replant the site. Uh, you don't see much standing timber now, but there was um, scattered blackened dead trees on this site and they just raw planted it as is. Uh, that didn't work out very well. So in uh, 20, 2019 there was some Forest for Tomorrow money made available for this site. They came in, they excavated, excavator mounted the site. Um, the whole purpose of doing the excavator mounting was not just to clear away the brush but it was also to create um, a spot that was shaded that the seedlings could be uh, protected from the direct sunlight as they were establishing. Um, the other benefit of making little mini mounds is the fact that when you're digging a hole you give a nice low spot to plant the tree in and of course that spot is going to collect water and nothing is going to make the difference on these sites more than having water available. So that's what was done uh, in the fall of 2019, the spring of 2020 they came in, they planted this site they used RTI tea bag fertilizer. It would have been the 10 gram Chilcotin pack, 1757. 2020 was an awesome year. We got lots of rain. That certainly helped uh, the seedlings benefit from the fertilizer. But part and parcel to that was the selection of the planting site. This was done optimally, in my opinion. They picked the lowest spot. They found a spot that was closest to the south edge of the screef so they had full protection from the sun. So you had a tree that had the, the best access possible to water and not only that was shaded from direct sunlight. So it gave it the best opportunity to take advantage of the fertilizer. And these seedlings certainly did and I have pictures from the fall of 2020 that I will add to this video so you can take a look to see what things look like. But as a result of the strength and the vigor that these trees picked up from the fertilizer in addition to optimal planting, they were able, for the most part, to take on the challenges that were presented by the heat dome in June of 2021. Although not everything survived, I would say this site looked great, considering what happened. Um, if these trees had not been fertilized and they were allowed to be what you would normally see in an interior Douglas fir stand, and they would be quite wispy, maybe even yellow, really quite light, wispy kind of leaders, I don't think that you're, you would end up with the same result. So at any rate, I'm going to go over this site and just show you a few trees and, uh, and show you why it's important to fertilize at the time of planting and how it can help you survive, not just year one, but year two and beyond. Okay, it's always fun to do a little bit of a walkabout. I wish that you were all here and we could all walk the site together and you could take a look and see what I'm seeing, but um, this will have to do. So I just thought that we'd go through, maybe walk a little ways and just 
show you a few of the trees and just see where they're surviving and what they look like. And I will be heading towards the south. So here's the Douglas fir again. Excellent positioning right down on the bottom of the hill hole. It was uh, nicely shaded, but I mean, you can't complain about that. If you had any Douglas fir, even on a wet year, forget about heat domes and everything like that. I, think, I don't think there's anybody who wouldn't take that tree. Now here's a lodgepole pine and you can see where it was exposed and uh, got a little bit too much sunshine. Uh, it wasn't protected very well at the top and it died at the top. However, the good news is the bottom's still alive and I expect it to fully recover over time. And that's a thing. If you can get them established, if you can keep them alive, that's key. Here's another Douglas fir. You can see even that brush. You know, if the, if the tree's got a nice bare spot, you know, a nice little opening around it, and it's got some brush in front of it, boy, that can sure come in handy for throwing shade during the summer and it can actually be a benefit. However, once again, it's got to be able to grow fast enough so that uh, when that brush starts to take over that space, that it's able to compete and get atop of it. Here's another lodgepole pine. Well, this baby's in the hole and it's totally shaded but you can see if you can get those trees shaded and you can get moisture to them I mean the base of that tree is right in the bottom of the hole you can see what things can look like what the potential is it's awesome I could just keep on going another Douglas fir Beautiful. Just love it. Here's another fur. Excellent. This one lost its top. It appears to me that the sun was direct enough and it was just a little bit soft in its leader when the full on heat dome hit. But you can see anywhere shaded, it's alive. And this tree has a very good opportunity to be able to recover. Okay, shadows in this unfortunately, but look at this one. Oh my goodness. Once again, planted way down deep at the bottom of the hole where they tell you not to plant. Fortunately, this one didn't make it, but maybe that's a function of the grass that's right around it. We know what a competitor grass is for moisture. It might have just taken everything from it. This one also impacted by the heat on the one side where it wasn't shaded, but overall, we got a really good tree and it's gonna recover. I'm excited about that. Here's another one. As you can see, I'm not really having a hard time here finding trees. And you would expect that a site on a ridge like this one once again, we're fully exposed to the south. You can only imagine how hot it got during the daytime. Um, you'd expect this whole place to be dead. But although there was like not everything survived, and there was areas up on the ridge that certainly had higher mortality, this is, uh, this is amazing what I'm finding here today. But once again, without the vigor and the strength of the nutrients provided by the fertilizer, I don't think this would be the case. Now here's a Douglas fir. Here's an example of what a lot of Douglas fir look like on this site. This is pretty exciting considering how difficult Douglas fir can be to regenerate in the IDF, but 
if the fertilizer is able to get into the seedling and it's able to take advantage of it because it has a good microsite, this is my expectation. Um, this is what you can see, and as a result, I would expect that good things are going to happen with this block over the longer term. Now, of course, part of the reason that the seedling was able to benefit from the fertilizer, of course, is site prep. And I'd just like to quickly go over what is it we're trying to accomplish with site prep when we're out here. Now, first and foremost, as I was talking about, if you just pan around the site. This. Yep. You can see there's a lot of brush here. And as a result of all this competition, um, if you were just to raw plant this site and expect trees to try and grow through this stuff, it would be a pretty hard time for them to do that. You would end up with the same result as they started with when they raw planted it the first time. So that's the first reason why we'd site prep. The second reason is to loosen the soil. Now if you can loosen the soil, even the bottom of the hole, even though it's much denser down here, it still gets a bit of loosening from the teeth of the bucket of the excavator. Loosening the soil does a number of things. The first two that I can think of that are most important is, first of all, it allows moisture to penetrate when it hits the ground. The second thing is, <clears throat> is that because it's looser, it allows roots to be able to extend out and it allows your trees to be able to develop its root system. Those are two very key important things to having a successful seedling on this site. Now, of course, in this situation in the IDF, because it's so hot and dry, as I explained before, this rock here and the edge of this screef provided shade to this seedling during its initial year of establishment. This is a critical time period. If it didn't have this shading and it was fully exposed to the sun, it would be very difficult for it um, to have enough moisture to be able to establish. So that was the other function of doing the site prep. So um, with those things in mind, that's what you're wanting to accomplish out here. Now I understand that depending on where you're at in the province that you might not be able to do this specifically. And I hope what my hope is is that you're focusing on the principles of what you're wanting to accomplish, not so much how you accomplish it. There may be many ways of accomplishing it. Unfortunately, a lot of site prep is done in the IDF and it does not fulfill what needs to be done in order to successfully set up a tree. Many times a site prep is done too shallow, so it doesn't do a whole heck of a lot as far as um, retaining moisture is concerned. And the other thing is that it leaves the, the seedling fully exposed to the sun. Sometimes a site prep is completely oriented right towards the sun. There's no shading whatsoever. In those types of situations, those trees just get fried. So you might need to be thinking about other things like leaving more trees in adjacent stands and things like that to provide shading to your tree during your establishment period. So at any rate, once again, focus on the principles of what you're wanting to accomplish. You're wanting to eliminate the competing vegetation, which competes with your tree for moisture and nutrients. You're wanting to loosen your soils to allow those roots to penetrate and for moisture to get in and you're wanting to provide shade. And if you can accomplish those things, then you should have good success here. And of course, you wanna give the tree everything that it possibly can to establish its vigor so that it's healthy and strong. Because this brush that you see in the background is not standing still. It is far worse this year than when I was here in the fall of last year. So it's gonna keep on coming and those trees had better be able to match it. And if they've just got two centimeter liters, they're gonna eventually get buried and you're right back to square one again. Okay, so here's an example of a larch tree that once again would have been planted in 2020. Here it is after the second growing season. But what I'd really like to focus on is not just the health and the vigor of this tree, even though it went through everything that it did, but you're probably only seeing maybe half of it is actually sticking out of this hole. So I am facing right now towards the south. And so the berm, which I'm pointing at with the shovel right here, <clears throat> positioned in this direction and having the tree right up against it would have provided shading last year during its most vulnerable time. It also would have provided, 
provided some shading this year to the lower branches and to the root system. The other thing that I like about this tree, you can come in closer. Point down at the bottom here, is the location of its planting. It was planted basically right at the bottom of the hole, which is exactly where you want it to be. This is where the maximum amount of water is going to be available for that tree. <clears throat> and you know, that doesn't only benefit just during year one, that benefits it for quite a long time. One of my, my Lemieux Creek trial shows that the benefits of collecting water around the base of the tree can last for years before it finally fills in. So this, is a, this has huge implications for the success of regenerating this site. Okay, so you're fertilizing with RTI tea bag fertilizer and you're wondering, okay, that's just awesome, but what's it doing for my tree? Well, the thing is, vigor of a tree is going to determine, and of course nutrient availability is a huge part of that, is going to determine how healthy your tree is and how resistant it is to things like the heat wave that we had. Now, first and foremost, my hand is behind the foliage of this Douglas fir. This is the most expensive part of the tree as far as nutrients demand is concerned. This is what the tree wants to develop. If you don't have a photosynthetic capacity, you are making sugar as a tree, and if you aren't making sugar, you're not making wood, and you're also not feeding yourself. So the ability and the capacity for the tree to be able to grow is hugely dependent on its photosynthetic capacity. It wants to develop the crown far beyond anything else. That is the most critical piece of the equation. They want to photosynthesize. They want to capture carbon. End of story. So that's the most nutrient demanding part of the tree. But part and parcel to that and second to it would be the root system and the fine roots in particular. Now these are roots that are some defined as less than two millimeters in diameter, but that's where the action happens. That's where the water is going into your tree from. It's where the nutrients are pulled up from. It's not the big thick woody roots that you tend to see when you're digging up seedlings. A lot of these roots fall off when you pull the tree out of the ground. And they're extra that's the second most nutrient demanding part of the tree. If you're wanting to have a strong root system, you're going to need to give it the nutrition it needs to be able to produce it. But secondary to that, and this also comes down to having a very vigorous, strong crown, is that roots respire. If they don't have any sugar, they don't have any food, they're not going anywhere. So if you have this great, big, gigantic root system, but you have no crown, you have no way of feeding it. So in order to have the strong root system that these trees need to be able to pull and draw water and nutrients out of these difficult sites, you're going to need a big crown and you're going to need a healthy, strong root system. So those are two of the things. The other thing is thinking about the other side, and this is often not talked about, is the qualitative part of the seedling. And that would be the part that would resist disease and stress from environmental impacts like frost, drought, those kinds of things. Now in order to do that, I mean one of the things for this heat dome of course would be the ability of these seedlings to produce thick waxy cuticles and compounds within themselves that are going to be able to help them um, be strong enough to resist these kinds of impacts. This is expensive stuff and as far as the priority goes the tree is going to be taken for care of photosynthesis and root development and a whole bunch of other things before it ever even thinks about defense because it's so expensive. It gets put off to the back. So in order to have enough um, for the tree to be healthy and strong enough to resist these kind of things, you want to give it the optimal nutrition when it's establishing. There is no more critical time. You can't come in and treat these trees with nitrogen 13 years and expect the same effect as you're going to get with a full suite of nutrients at the time of planting. <clears throat> the, the time to establish a tree, the time to build its strength, is right at the very beginning and, and to lay a good foundation. So that's why it's important. That's why you want to fertilize at the time of planting. Once again, um, not just thinking about survival in year one, because we know that in the IDF, you might have good survival in year one, but trees drop out. And by the time you get to free growing, there's hardly anything left. 
in many cases. To avoid that from happening, you need a strong, healthy, vigorous tree that's going to make it for the long term. So we're thinking survival year two and beyond. One of the things that I've heard a lot over the years, and people wonder whether it's it makes sense to fertilize on a dry site or not. And of course I've gone over some of the trees and how great they look and they were able to take advantage of the fertilizer. But a lot of times results for people are quite mixed. Now, to try and put things in perspective, let's say you were crazy enough to try and put a garden up here and you wanted to plant some tomatoes. What are the chances that you would just take that tomato and stab it into the ground and fertilize it and expect a really nice looking tomato plant full of tomatoes when you came back in late August? What are the chances of that happening with all this grass and competing vegetation, dense soils? What are the chances of that happening? They're not very good. Now, if the one variable that you took a look at was, well, I fertilized it, so obviously the fertilizer doesn't work. Yeah, I fertilized a tomato, I went to the garden center, they told me if you fertilize these tomatoes, tomatoes love fertilizer, you fertilize them, you're gonna have amazing tomatoes. But you treated it as I just described. Would you expect the fertilizer to be the problem? Of course not. And it's not any different with seedlings. Tree seedlings are the same as any other plant. How you treat them, you, the, the first and most important thing is the microsite that you give them. That has got to be the foundation. Anything that you do above and beyond that is building upon that foundation. If you don't have a good foundation, you can't expect anything that you build upon it <clears throat> to be very successful. So, I guess the question is, when you take a look at this tree, for instance, you look, mm. I mean, at least it's alive. It's actually not too bad. It was fertilized at the time of planting and had it not been, I would expect it to look a whole lot worse. However, compared to some of the other trees that I was showing, and I'll just give another example. Okay, so here's a tree. It's just a few meters away, a few short meters away from the one that was raw planted in the site prep site. And just take a look at the difference leader length, needle length, caliper, just overall robustness and health of the seedling. Just because it was put in a microsite where it could access water and had some shading and wasn't having to force to deal with the grass. Okay, so as you can see, this seedling doesn't look as good as the other one. And it's simply a function of not the fact that they were both fertilized, but one of them was put in a favorable microsite and one was not. Now, in order to have the best chances of success to site prep, do you have to site prep every time? Not necessarily. If, you're, if you can raw plant a site and it has adequate moisture, you can put it behind a stump or a log and you can get some shading, protection from the competing vegetation, you can have an excellent result too. But the bottom line is to the degree that your microsite meets the needs of the seedling, as far as protecting it from competition and providing moisture is gonna dictate the response that you're going to get from that seedling um, with regards to the fertilizer. Okay, back to uh, talking a little bit more about longer term survival of trees that were fertilized at the time of planting. I'm uh, now standing on a site just a little ways down the road. It's got of a, I don't know, a bit of a southeast aspect to it, um, but it still gets a lot of good heat in the afternoon sun. This plant, this site is also in the McClure fire. It was planted, well, let's see, two years after the fire, just raw planted after harvesting, after salvage harvesting. And the result wasn't very good. We waited it out for a number of years. We fill planted it a time or two, trying to get trees back in, but uh, that wasn't working. So finally, in uh, this one would have been in 2018, they would have site prepped it in the fall. Done the same thing, made the same mini mounds that were done on the previous site that I had just shown you and they came in the following spring in the spring of 2019 and they fertilized at the time of planting once again with our 10 gram chill coat packs so 
one thing I'd like to mention about the spring of 2019, and I imagine most of you are not going to remember it because 2019 was not really known as a dry summer in the southern interior. However, when these trees were planted was would have been the end of April, beginning of May, and the first couple of weeks of May in 2019 were extremely hot. It was like summer got turned on right away. We were talking in the low 30s. Definitely ma major vapor pressure deficits around the seedlings as they're trying to flush. But once again, these seedlings were planted in the bottom of the hole, up against the screef, totally protected in the shade, and the result speaks for itself. Now here it is three years later and we still have what I would consider to be a stock stand with the trees looking not too bad. This larch beside me is one of the better ones to be sure but still goes to show the potential possibilities even on these tough dry sites when you fertilize at the time of planting what you can get. So uh, yeah once again we can go take a quick little walk through and uh, just show you some longer term potential at year three uh, by fertilizing at the time of planting with our Joe Coton Packs. Okay, so this site was basically a pine larch mix, mostly larch, maybe a tad bit of Douglas fir, but there's just some of the trees as we're going through. Some of the holes definitely we did have some mortality, but it wouldn't have happened this year. There's another larch, one of the original pine, another larch from the fill plant. There's a pine tree. again here's another pine good one but all if you were to look at their microsites all of their faces of their stem you can see the shading from the screef you can see it was planted in the bottom of the hole as low down as possible well, here's another one another pine tree Right there. So, yeah, overall stocking is pretty good in here. It's not perfect, but it's certainly much better than it was by raw planting it. So, giving a seedling everything that it needs certainly makes a big difference. Here's a few more. Another pine tree tucked in behind the screef. Doesn't look like it now, it's hard to tell, but. There's the screef planted in the bottom. This one, the same thing. Beautiful. Did a really good job. There's another one. These are good looking trees. Three years in a dry site like this. Again, planted at the bottom of the hole. That's your spot. It may not. Uh, be where traditionally we went, but this is where you want to be now, considering the summers we've been having. Now look at that one. Really good tree. Okay, I just want to thank you guys once again for taking the time to watch this video. I really hope that it shows you the potential of fertilizing at the time of planting and dry sites and not what it can do necessarily just during year one, but what it can do for the longer term and how it can give you a vigorous, robust, fully stocked plantation through the, through the free growing period and beyond. So I hope I was ex able to explain to you also how to get the most out of the product. It's a tool and like any tool that you use for anything, it needs to be implemented properly, taking in other lim all the other limiting factors into consideration. It's part of a silviculture regime. It is not the entire regime. It is not a silver bullet. But put together with everything else correctly and taking into account site limiting factors, whether you prep or whether you can get away with raw planting, whatever it would be, um, you're going to have a very good chance of a very successful plantation if you <clears throat> put it all together. So once again, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at integralfm at telus.net and I'm happy to answer anything. Thanks again for watching.